Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin uh, up in Michigan where we're finally getting rid of snow. No mm -hmm. more snow. And I have Jeff Squires down in Kentucky. Jeff, thanks again for helping me out. Yeah, Kentucky where we're getting uh, tornadoes and thunderstorms and all kinds of other bad weather. But it's nice today, so I can't complain. Mm. Not too much, at least. <laughs> So you can find the RCE shows online at rce-cast.com. There's a link to subscribe for iTunes and an RSS feed there. You can also find all the old shows because I noticed that iTunes only shows like the last 10 shows or so. Uh, also, Jeff has a blog and works on OpenMPI and a few other pieces of information. So, Jeff, you have some information about that. So, yes, I have a blog out at blogs.cisco.com. My corporate overlords like me to mention that on here. Um, and it's also linked to from the RCE cast site. I very, very occasionally tweet something, um, but I do every every once in a while. Um, but I think more interesting than all of that stuff that we say at the beginning of every show is that we now have another member of the second time guest club on today's show. <laughs> Yes, our guest today, who is a repeat, is Travis Oliphant, um, but we also have with him Anthony Skopatz and Warren uh, Wekeser. I think I just screwed up his name. <laughs> um, he can correct me on that. <laughs> this, is, this show is very well known for getting everybody's names absolutely perfect. I just want to go on record saying that. Yes. So, guys, I wonder if... Uh, you could uh, introduce yourselves using the proper pronunciation of your names. <laughs> sure. Well, it's great to be on the show again, Brock and Jeff. Thank you for inviting us back. Uh, my name is Travis Oliphant, and uh, we have Anthony Skopatz and Warren Wekeser. We're actually here in Austin, where it's beautiful today. I'm glad you're getting rid of snow in Michigan, but I don't think we ever got any down here. Uh, it's been a great winter. We got some fires, but <laughs> they get a few fires. But um, we're happy to be here. Um, Happy to answer questions or talk a bit about uh, uh, SciPy. Yes, today we're going to be talking about SciPy. Uh, that's S-C-I-P-Y, a scientific Python. Uh, Travis was nice enough to get some uh, other SciPy folks that worked on it with him as a nice follow-up to RCE number 48, where Travis talked to us about NumPy, which I believe is, has some sort of relationship with SciPy, and we're going to get into the guts of that here in just a moment. So, guys, can you give us a little bit of breakdown, each one of you, how you're involved with SciPy? Sure. Uh, I'll start and hand over to the other folks. This is Travis. Um, SciPy really started uh, back in 1999, uh, and my involvement in SciPy was to create some of the early modules that got rolled into SciPy in 2001, and then I worked with Eric and Piaru to or actually create the name SciPy and put all these modules together. Uh, well, this is Warren. I'm basically uh, sort of a user and or and developer in SciPy. Um, I started using it several years ago before I even got to NThought. Um, when I was in academia, using it just for research and plotting nice plots of solution differential equations. Um, about a year and a half or so ago, I got involved in actually contributing to and adding features to SciPy. So I'm both a developer and an active user of, of SciPy. Um, hi, and this is Anthony. I'm, I, much like Warren, was using SciPy to do uh, research um, in my graduate program. And then um, I'm also sort of a fair weather developer on uh, on SciPy, but both Warren and I are, or Warren is the program committee head for the, Sci the corresponding SciPy conference um, this year, and I am chairing a track in that conference as well, the uh, Python and Core Technologies track, so um, sort of involved in the community in other ways. Hey, let, let, let's get a little plug for that right now. Give us uh, the 30-second spiel on the SciPy conference. When is it? How do people attend? Um, what kind of program can they expect? Stuff like that. Sure. I'll, I'll try to keep it to 30 minutes or, <laughs> or 30 seconds, I mean. Uh, I, I get the chance to be the SciPy co-chair this year. Uh, SciPy uh, happens every year, and this year it's in Austin, Texas. And it's the week of July 11th to July 16th. Starts with some tutorials. It's a great time to actually learn SciPy and Python for scientific computing in general. Great people come and give uh, excellent tutorials. Uh, very inexpensive, actually, by the way. Uh, and then after that, there's two days of conference and then two days of sprints uh, after that. So it's a, it's a full week starting on July 11th and ending on July 16th. Um, there will be a two special tracks this year, one for Python in data science, 
as well as another Python and core technologies where uh, we advertise the fact that scientists use Python for their technical computing needs because it gives them exposure to a wide community of other tools that they need to use besides just the nice algorithms that may be linked into Python. And that will now be available at the SciPy conference, information about those in a, in a more, uh, more depth than perhaps in the past. Uh, registration is online. Go to <laughs> conferences.scipy.org. In fact, if you just go to the www.scipy.org site, there'll be a sidebar that says conferences, and that'll take you right to, uh, there's actually three conferences in SciPy throughout the world, but there's one happening in, in the U.S. Uh, this summer, and you can go to that link, and there's a link there to register. And registration is open until uh, really uh, middle of June, so there's, there's plenty of time to register. And even after that, if you can come and register on site as well. So... SciPy, Scientific Python, um, what is it? Because like we talked about NumPy on show 48, and that was pretty useful to scientific users too. So what sets apart SciPy from NumPy? Yeah, I think I'll start just a little bit by uh, SciPy really at, at this point is is many things. That name SciPy is, is sometimes refers to the website. <laughs> sometimes it refers to the community in general of all the people developing scientific applications for Python. Uh, but originally SciPy and it still is a library of tools and kind of fundamental tools that people might need to do technical computing. It's got things like optimization, image processing, signal processing, uh, interpolation, linear algebra, uh, integration, uh, ordinary differential equation integration, different kinds of fundamental tools that somebody might need, really building on top of NumPy. Yeah, I, I would jump in here and say that it's, it's really about uh, being a, a collection of stuff that um, scientific users uh, or scientific programmers uh, don't want to code up themselves, right? Like you don't, every time you want to go and solve your differential equation, you don't want to have to go and write your own, you know, stochastic integration function. That, that's not really a good use of your time if you're trying to solve some heat transport equation. You want to, you want to focus on the, the science. You don't want to focus on the algorithm development necessarily. So, um, and then the reason it sits on top of uh, NumPy is because NumPy gives you this great data structure for handling your your arrays of data, right? So, this is Warren. Um, also, point out that in, in much of SciPy is actually um, code that has been written over the over the past several decades. That's a very solid, reliable Fortran or C code. Um, you know, the standard ODE solvers or optimization libraries and, and much of other ones. And SciPy provides the Python wrapper for this, you know, solid, robust code that's been around a long time. So it's nice to have that. So you get the advantage of these powerful, solid, reliable libraries and also this, the, the, the benefit of a, a Python language, which is a very nice, powerful language for doing all the other work besides the core number crunching. So is that a good way to differentiate between SciPy and NumPy is that NumPy is kind of the, the glue underneath the, the data structures and things like that, and SciPy are the algorithms and other things that put together and use those data structures? Yeah, that's reasonable. I mean, I think NumPy, the core part of NumPy is sort of the, you know, an array, an array object with a lot of powerful ways to manipulate arrays, um, again, much more efficient than you could do in pure Python. Um, and then SciPy, in fact, many other tools besides SciPy use NumPy as that for its core array data structure. Um, Matplotlib is a plotting library that uses NumPy as a basis. Um, there's many others, too, I can think of on top of my head. But, uh, yeah. um, there's a lot of tools. When you come to Python, you recognize it's so easy to write code. And scientists recognize that as well. But they need access to some of the these fundamental tools, like a Runge-Kutta integrator or a uh, Anderson um, ordinary differential equation integration tool, or they need some uh, image processing capability. SciPy is really a collection of those tools, the library SciPy, but the SciPy community has, as Warren was hinting at, also created a, a lot of other tools that build on top of the NumPy data structures and give you access to wavelet transforms, image reading and writing uh, capabilities, uh, additional optimization algorithms. Rhythms. It's a, it really is the, that need is larger than any one library, and that's sort of what we found out uh, kind of over the 10 years or so the SciPy uh, organization and community has been evolving. Uh, it started by with just a bunch of people who came to Python together and really liked coding with Python, typically coming from Matt.